Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's been a while since my last time uh, at, uh, at Dot Next, and yesterday one of you that I crossed in the lobby mentioned that. And uh, I said, well, yes, I took a break uh, last year uh, because it's, it's a normal uh, flow of things, you know, the change, because sometimes uh, the guy agreed, yes, sometimes it's a good thing to change faces, uh, and it's exactly, that's the point, that's exactly what I'm saying to my wife uh, every day, but she doesn't agree to change faces. But ch change faces is, uh, is critical, is important, is valuable, and uh, ASP.NET changed quite a, quite a few uh, faces uh, over over the years, um, I think it was uh, 2015, or probably, yes, that was uh, 2015, so well, uh, three and a half uh, a year ago, when uh, I gave a talk, I think it was in Moscow, known in St. Petersburg, about ASP.NET Core and uh, what, at the time, looked like the state of the art. And it was an interesting time, because uh, if I remember correctly, 2015, late 2015, was more or less the time in which Microsoft announced the RC, I don't know, one, two, three, four, just to change completely their mind in a few weeks to say, oh, I'm sorry, it's done when it's done. So even though we announced RC, whatever, forget it. It was a joke. No, well, it was a lot more serious than just a joke because ASP.NET and around it, uh, the whole uh, .NET uh, core uh, thing uh, uh, probably grew, expanded beyond, well beyond uh, the original uh, uh, goals that were set uh, now back to probably 2014, which was, if I remember correctly, again, the first time I heard about that. So it's been a few years now. And uh, thanks God, uh, today we finally have the mythical version 3. It's, uh, you know, again, it's a joke or it's a reality. It's up to you, but uh, for a long time, uh, uh, developers, people in this industry, in the .NET, in the Microsoft stack, learned that there is no reliable Microsoft product until version 3. Maybe, okay, again, it's a joke, it's not, but fact is that version number 3 indicates, in general terms, uh, a sort of a maturity for whatever product. And yes, ASP.NET Core mythical version 3 is a different story. Because it's exactly the same as it was the version before. So ASP.NET Core 3.0 is uh, uh, not yet fully released. There are a few uh, previews that have been around uh, for, uh, for, um, for, a few, uh, for a few weeks already. Uh, there will be probably more coming in the coming weeks, uh, but the official uh, uh, time frame for release is set for uh, September or October in between Q3 and uh, Q4. So let's uh, take a look, and this is the purpose of this presentation, at what we find in uh, ASP.NET Core and what we don't find in ASP.NET Core. What is under uh, the surface uh, that has not been completely unveiled and something that uh, uh, gives us the perspective of what could change possibly in the future, because yes, there are so many uh, stupid things that happen when you talk. Uh, there are so um, many minor things under the hood and many faces that ASP.NET uh, uh, changed. No, sorry about that, oh, let me kill. Uh, okay, no, he was not showing up there. Sorry, it was just me. I was seeing Skype notifications, sorry about that. So ASP.NET 3.0 is, uh, ASP.NET Core 2.2 plus a few other things. And I briefly listed uh, the things that 
if you look at the release uh, notes, appear to be different in 3.0. Nothing really serious. Okay, a Newton Soft JSON.NET has been removed uh, from the shared framework. Uh, um, EF Core now ships as, as a separate NuGet package. Oh, wow. Uh, ASP.NET Core 3.0, this is important, only runs on the cross-platform .NET Core 3. And it will not run on the Windows only .NET framework. This is a big change, but it's nothing that affects directly the code we write. It, more, it, it mostly affects uh, the decision making layer. C Sharp 8 will be only supported in .NET Core 3.0, and then, oh wow, we have uh, as uh, one of the most relevant. Uh, uh, programming features, support for what they were, what was called and renamed many times. One of the names used to indicate that is Razor Components, also known as Blazor server-side components. I will have a talk this afternoon if you're interested in Blazor. The way I like to present Blazor is the Microsoft Angular framework. So, again, is essentially the same it was on the foundation of 2.0 release over a year ago, 2.2 exceptions plus SignalR plus Blazor. All together it forms Core 3.0, which is not even long-term support. The expectations are for .NET, .NET Core 3.1 to be uh, the version with long-term uh, support, which means that Microsoft guarantees uh, uh, whichever is longer between uh, three years of full support or uh, the new, a new major LTS version. Now, this said, let's get into a few things about, uh, about the ASP.NET Core. So, what is really different? Number one, the most relevant thing that is completely different from uh, any ASP.NET you may remember is uh, the pipeline. What uh, you see on the screen now is uh, the schema of the pipeline of the past. So we're coming from this situation. That was uh, uh, well done, uh, optimized for the purposes it had ASP.NET runtime, the same in, uh, on duty since the very old days of Web Forms 1.0. Uh, there's a funny story about this framework. Uh, everyone, every developer at least once had to complain about this uh, uh, runtime because it had the view state in it, because uh, it was uh, uh, swamped, because it was old, because it was uh, uh, not fully testable, blah, 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 blah. But however, the underlying old system.web runtime was great for uh, the, the goals it had. The issue is that over the years, has Microsoft tried to make the ASP.NET platform appealing to many more and uh, different heterogeneous uh, uh, groups uh, of developers, they essentially put stuff on top of the original pipeline, making the application, not the pipeline, run in a much slower way. Uh, for example, uh, about 10 years after the release of the old Web Forms 1 runtime pipeline, Microsoft decided that it would have been great for developers to be able to write web applications on the Microsoft stack using the MVC paradigm. So they created the ASP.NET MVC, and uh, they coded it like that. So essentially they branched the pipeline and uh, the point of branch was uh, condition-based. Essentially, they make uh, a check on the coming uh, URL, and if the URL uh, can be mapped to a physical file on the server, it is processed the usual way through the 
web forms, old fashioned system, dot web baked up runtime. If it's not, so if the URL doesn't match any physical file, then it is branched and it's being processed through a completely different parallel pipeline. So at the end of the day, and it shows pretty neatly in the slide, if you write an ASP.NET MVC application, you end up having at the same time two pipelines. Even worse, when they had the wonderful idea of launching web API, because it was uh, it were the days of uh, uh, system-oriented architectures, and the, the term microservices uh, uh, wasn't coined or wasn't used yet, it were web services and services uh, service-oriented architecture, that was all the rage. But web API is a third pipeline <laughs> katana based on top of those two. Of course, oh yes, the application is not that fast, it's not that responsive, and the culprit is system.web and the underlying pipeline. So let's rewrite that. And here's how they had done it. It's nearly the same. So, inspired by the Web Forms 1, they created a new pipeline, which is a radically different, completely rewritten, okay? If you look at the technical implementation because it's middleware-based, which is a totally different principle. So it's a different thing, great thing, it works beautifully, it's fine. It allows to arrange uh, server applications that really contains the smallest amount of code that is uh, <laughs> legally necessary to achieve uh, whatever you want. So we have a new pipeline but the MVC programming model sit, sit, still is a branch added on top of that. So if you check out, if you have some, and, and even a minimal experience in ASP.NET Core programming, you know, you should know very well, that is all about having a startup class in which you configure the runtime services you wanna work with, uh, using those services and configuring those services still in the startup class, uh, you can uh, shape up the sequence of middleware components that will be involved in uh, any, in the processing of any, each and every uh, request in the order in which they are listed, but uh, th this sequence of middleware components uh, finds its end when uh, yeah, the bottom of the chain is reached and it's where you need to have, for the sake of your application, something called the terminating middleware. The terminating middleware is the piece of code that is physically responsible for producing some output, for terminate the chain. So the middleware list of components is processed twice and the second time is after the output for the request has been produced and uh, the second time each middleware component is given a chance to run, the order of them is reversed. So the first component registered to process the request is the first to be triggered on the way to the middleware, the terminating middleware, and after the request has been processed, so whatever calculation, whatever uh, operation, database query or write you need to do has been done, on the way back to the requesting user agent, the, mid the list of middleware components is traversed, but this time from the last to the first. This is the architecture of any uh, middleware-centric uh, uh, pipeline. So what is the role of MVC in all of this? Uh, the message that we received when Core, ASP.NET Core was first released is, we don't support anymore web forms. Great. So if you want to build UI front ends using a, a, a not simple UI-less web APIs, you have to rely on the MVC paradigm. Wonderful. The MVC paradigm is the only 
built in out of the box terminating middleware. So it's the well, the only one is no longer true, but let's say it's the, the primary, the default, so to speak, uh, way to produce some output. But the problem is that when uh, you reach the terminating middleware of MVC, you enter into a black box. You don't know what happens there. You enter into a second pipeline, which is exactly the pipeline for MVC request processing we had before ASP.NET Core. So they changed the underlying pipeline. They didn't change the MVC paradigm, and they still put the MVC paradigm as a black box on top of the now middleware-based pipeline as a branch. And the condition that determines which branch you take in the request processing is no longer a check on the URL, whether it is bound to a physical file or not, as it was in the, in the non-core ASP.NET, but it's now your decision of adding or not the NVC runtime service in your uh, startup configuration of the application. What about this? POCO controllers, gRPC services, SignalR hubs, worker services, NVC controllers, API controllers. These are six different ways in which you ultimately can process, can produce output, a response for an incoming HTTP request. So it's not just about NVC. NVC is one of these six. These have been added one after the next along the way, but today, state of the art, ASP.NET Core 3.0 going to be released, we have at least these six options. And if you run, if you install and play with Visual Studio 2019, you will find those options available as ready-made Visual Studio templates. MVC controllers, you know what it is. I mean, it is exactly the, the thing you may have learned about uh, learning uh, MVC programming since you know the past the past decade when it was first uh, released. API controllers, uh, that's an interesting story. It's uh, what has remained of the old idea of Web API. You may remember that Web API was uh, pompously introduced as, yeah, the new great framework for building UI-less services. Web services, service-oriented components of a service-oriented architecture. Today, we would say microservices. But before .NET Core, Web API had its own middleware-based runtime. It was the third, okay, on top of the, the third pipeline, on top of the basic one, MVC, Web API. Three for the performance of one. In a core, they just dropped. And this was the best decision they could ever make. They just dropped any idea of Web API. Why? Because they took the middleware pipeline architecture they devised for Web API when it was a separate thing, and uh, built the ASP.NET Core pipeline inspired by the same ideas. At the end of the day, the real difference between uh, Web API and MVC is in uh, minor things, extra, st extra tasks that the Web API controller performs. So what they have done in core is just uh, expanding the responsibilities of the controller class in MVC so that it now can cover also the additional features that w earlier were a responsibility of the Web API controller. So in core, there is no longer any difference between an API controller or a classic controller. It's the same thing. They do the same. So MVC controllers and API controllers are now the same thing. 
and uh, it's your uh, responsibility as a developer as developers to decide exactly what kind of output you want to serve whether html json xml or whatever else what about uh, poco controllers at first to me it made no sense at all why technically a poco controller is a, a poco class plain old c sharp object compared to a controller what is the difference is that the poco controller is a class that can be treated by the runtime as a controller except that it doesn't have any dependencies on the http nvc runtime environment you don't have any http context in it uh, there is no controller based class that provides methods to override and uh, there is no connection between uh, the methods of the POCO controller and the canonical pipeline of MVC. Uh, in the canonical pipeline of the MVC model, you have things like the action filter, action filters, uh, action uh, selection methods. Uh, you can have exception handling authorization filters. All those things that you can control programmatically and mostly through attributes before the method executes, all those things are not supported in a POCO controller because it's a POCO class and it's not a controller-based class. Why we want to have these POCO controllers? Essentially for performance reasons. Essentially to, um, to give our applications uh, Non UI, typically non UI applications, uh, a way to expose a facade that can be easily mapped to URLs according to uh, routing rules, uh, easy to configure, and still have the controller class infrastructure to easily you know, mix and match URLs and methods. So it's a, it's a, common, it's, it's a facility. Uh, in the form of controllers without the burden of doing uh, uh, in-depth HTTP processing. So it's, a, it's yet another way, optional way, to build your application using a controller-based logic without the extra things HTTP-related and pipeline-related you just don't need. So if you just have a URL and this URL matches to a, a method and this method has no dependencies whatsoever, you can use a POCO controller instead of a plain NVC uh, controller. Okay, and then more recently, and uh, I'm talking about the gRPC services, uh, SignalR hubs, and the worker services, those things are more recent uh, in the Order, the order in which they came was SignalR, Worker Services, GRPC Services. These are three new facades, three new programming front ends for you to map incoming requests to the code, to the backend code that is actually and ultimately responsible for producing some, some output. The reason why I have those six points put in the same slide is to answer the question, who really does the job of producing output for our requests? We have, well, six options. If we, want, if we like to have, a con for our own convenience, if we'd like to have a, a controller-based, the lightweight possible controller-based infrastructure, Poco controllers. If we want to have a, a plain NVC UI rich application, NVC controllers. Uh, if we have, a, if we need to have a, a, a RESTful API, API controllers. If we need to have a component, a, a microservice that does notification work and in a, in a CQRS architecture, but even in a microservices scenario, when something happens remotely, you need to find a way to notify it back. So, okay, 
buses, queues, uh, service buses are an option, but in some cases also a direct point-to-point -point, uh, signal R notification is, uh, is an option. So here it is, uh, uh, signal R. But nicely in the core, uh, signal R hubs can act as controllers. They are, the hub class is publicly exposed via URL. It can be invoked to trigger an action. So the classic scenario in which you trigger a task from the user interface, say a long running task, and then you need to monitor, to be notified of the progress that this task makes as it runs on possibly a, 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 a remote server. This can be achieved now in core by simply putting a hub front end reachable via URLs, this hub triggers the remote task or offloads the remote task and gets info from the progress done by the task and pushes it back to the user interface. So you don't need controllers, technically, to monitor long-running tasks, as long as you know how to run the task. So the controller is uh, technically in, the, in, in, in any signal R enabled scenario is only the uh, trigger to run the code, but this trigger could be as well the hub itself. So in uh, UI-less services where you need a notification, the plain signal R hub is yet another way to do the job of processing incoming requests. Lightweight way. Worker services. In Visual Studio 2019, you have a dedicated template for worker services. It's uh, hangfire.io. So, okay, minimal version of that, but the idea is the same. So it's a worker service, background service, uh, also a queue service, very basic in, it, in the whole set of functionalities, but still functional to implement simple things like run periodically on the server a task. So every 24 hours, every three hours, every minute, every second, you decide the frequency or with, with a little bit of extra code, every day at midnight do this. Those scenarios that were in the need of using external frameworks and hang higher IO is just uh, the most popular are now to some extent possible right in ASP.NET Core through uh, worker services. Scheduling, scheduling tasks, that's what you can do with worker services. And again, for dedicated services, this is yet another way for you to address some task directly via URL. And finally, gRPC services. Now, gRPC is a framework. G, I think, stands for Google, and uh, which is the company who originally uh, wrote uh, the code for this framework, which was then open source. It's been a few years already, so now it, gRPC is an open, an open source uh, uh, framework uh, that does allow us to do remote procedure calls. Not REST, remote procedure call. So you define your remote objects through a contract. Uh, if anybody here uh, has some gray hair and may remember about DCOM, distributed COM of the 90s, it's, yeah, there, there are some analogy between gRPC and, uh, and the DCOM. Uh, with gRPC you define uh, a contract like the interface definition language of COM and DCOM of the 90s. So you define exactly how many endpoints you're gonna have, uh, which parameters and which message types actually uh, those methods uh, take and return. And uh, the communication over the network is managed through uh, a new binary protocol for transmission, which is called protocol buffer, and using HTTP2 
as the transport layer. So the combined effect of HTTP2 with all the additional features like streaming and bidirectional streaming that HTTP2 brings in, combined with the binary nature, super compact nature of this protocol buffer uh, network protocol, make gRPC services very, very, very fast compared to uh, RESTful, JSON-based, uh, even when you message pack is used interfaces. There are pros and cons, so I'm not saying that gRPC is great for everyone because gRPC binds you to a very specific, statically defined interface. It's much like you, you have an assembly, you reference an assembly, except that this assembly, like it was said for DCOM, has a longer wire that you know, spans across, across the network. In ASP.NET Core 3.0, we have built-in templates and uh, uh, support for uh, gRPC services. By the way, uh, using gRPC in .NET Core and even in classic .NET is possible because uh, the, the Google, the original Google framework uh, already came with bindings for a number of languages, including uh, C-sharp, so there are plenty of examples out there that show how you can uh, uh, arrange uh, gRPC services without uh, uh, the, the ASP.NET Core 3.0, but in the 3.0, we have uh, built-in facilities in the, in the .NET framework. So there are additional assemblies. So, what do we learn from this, and where can we go from here? Dreaming of a new ASP.NET, which is not 3.0, I still have, but that's my personal opinion, dubbed that it will be 3.1, which will follow up a few weeks or a few months after the release of 3.0, uh, September, October this year. We have now, as a matter of fact, multiple channels in the current state-of-the-art ASP.NET Core. We have multiple channels to reach endpoints, those six channels on the previous uh, previous slide. At the same time, we have a, a middleware-based core pipeline that still has a black box on top of it when you get into the space of MVC. At the same time, MVC, the MVC paradigm, has its own internal pipeline for processing the request made of action filters, uh, made of uh, action results and things like that, routing is another feature. Those things could be helpful to have at the level of the global core pipeline. So they, it's a pity, it's a blame to have those features restricted only to the MVC space, which is only one out of six possible channels to make a response out of a request. So the point is, if we have six different ways to process a request, and we have uh, in MVC only additional level of controls on the step-by-step -step procedure that takes uh, to the production of the output. Why not dreaming of having those things like, you know, uh, filter-like features, uh, action result controls, also available for gRPC, for worker services, for uh, POCO controllers, and so forth. This would bring to flat the picture here. So the above branch added for the MVC model will no? flat and mix and merge with the core middleware. This is no longer the reality today, but this is hopefully something that will happen in the future. Because in the end, Microsoft did uh, did a half good job. They completely rewrote the underlying pipeline, and uh, in doing that, they, they, they picked up a modern, effective architecture that allows developers to really write extremely fast, no fluff, just stuff, services. This is what the industry says. We love ASP.NET Core because it allows us to write and put on really fast services. But at the same time, when we go out from what is probably the most common scenario for using uh, core, so 
backend for Angular or for React or maybe Vue.js front ends. When we go to the to the space of building true full stack applications on the on the ASP.NET platform, we run into MVC, and MVC is a black box. It's a, an opaque thing on top of. It's a bolted on. It's not a native part of the pipeline. And if we mix this with the idea that we still have gRPC, worker services, SignalR, six different ways to do the same. And the pipeline in this respect is yet not the ideal pipeline we can dream of. OK, this said, has developers, has companies uh, still considering uh, what to do with uh, ASP.NET Core? There are basically six areas of key changes that we have to deal with. So we, if we need to measure in some way the effort, the learning curve we face when we decide to jump on ASP.NET Core, these are the key areas to consider. Middleware, so the pipeline, that's completely different. We have no longer globalized X. Uh, we have uh, the possibility of doing exactly the same things we, we could do with web config and globalized X in older uh, ASP.NET uh, frameworks, uh, but uh, everything now is different. Configuration, completely different. There is a DOM. There's a document object model you can arrange taking data from many different uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, sources, mostly JSON files, but not necessarily that. Also, the, the configuration thing, the configuration story is, uh, is even more powerful than in the past. In the past, we were probably using databases or the web config file to store a bunch of application-wide uh, configuration settings. and uh, those settings uh, were, for the most part, constant until the next restart of the application. So to change one of those settings inevitably forced us to okay, restart the application. So we never consider in the past decade at least scenarios where hot changes to the global application configuration was uh, a reality. Maybe it was an exception, but not the norm. Now, in the configuration API in ASP.NET Core, we also have built-in facilities for a hot change of the configuration. Uh, exception handling. This is another very, very interesting story. Uh, it reminds me the pattern that Microsoft followed way back when they shifted from active server pages. Remember that? to uh, ASP.NET, in which they took some of the best practices that the industry had matured out of experience in the past years, and they engineered those practices and exposed as new features, built-in features in the new platform. They did exactly the same thing here in the transition from ASP.NET to ASP.NET Core. And uh, exception handling is uh, one of those areas where this shows up. Uh, very, very nicely. Uh, no matter the millions of articles, blog posts, books also, that tell you how many ways you have to do exception handling, there is just one reliable way in a web application to do exception handling. Using in the, I mean, I'm talking about the old ASP.NET, application error, event handler, in the globalized acts, because that is the only way you have to capture every possible error. You still are encouraged and even recommended to use the try-catch blocks wherever you can. That's great. But beyond the try-catch around single individual operations, there are a number of possible uh, exceptions that could take place that you don't get. In non-core ASP.NET, the most illustrious example is model binding. If there's an error in the binding between the stuff in the URL and the interface of any controller method being invoked, you don't, it's an exception thrown, but you don't get it. So all the uh, own exception uh, methods to override in the controller class, exception filters, all those things don't work in case of 404 
in case of authorization errors in case of model binding errors. So the ideal way is putting a global safety net around your application and from there redirect the user to an error page. How would you do that? Redirect to an error page. Now, if uh, you want to just redirect to a generic static error page, fine, it's a plain 302. But if you want to give some context sensitive message about what has happened, what went wrong to your users, then it's an issue. Because if you redirect using a 302 HTTP, you lose because of the statelessness of the protocol, you lose information about the exception. If you store the exception to session or whatever else, you have the problem of scaling up the application. You have the potential issue of scaling up the application from one server to multiple servers. Okay, you can use a cookie. So, so there are a number of you know, possible solutions, but nothing that is really cool. The best practice for this kind of thing proven to be using a, a sort of internal redirect within the MVC model. So like uh, you place uh, something that looks like to the MVC runtime internal pipeline has a new request that will be processed by the internal action invoker component and mapped to a controller. So it's like a new request comes, but it's not coming through HTTP. So the state, the, the, the overall state of the application remains the same. So the exception that you have in memory that has been raised remains there. And you can redirect using this uh, internal shortcut mechanism to a controller method and pass the exception as a parameter. So this was a trick in uh, NVC non-core. It's been made uh, a built-in feature instead in core. So this is what, what has changed in exception handling. So you have now a method, a service, a runtime service, use exception handler, you put there the URL, it's another URL, but that URL, in case of exception, will be invoked without any 302 HTTP. So without going back to the browser and then in again. It's something resolved internally, finding a shortcut to invoke that controller from within the NVC internal pipeline. Authentication is different. Uh, in first place, it's different because we have no longer anything like web config. So we have no other place where we read about the name of the authentication cookie, uh, parameters like uh, the, the duration uh, of the cookie, uh, the login page, and so forth. Those things now must be specified using the middleware. Beyond that, authentication is different because of uh, the claim-based nature of the content we stuff in the cookie. Uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago actually, when uh, ASP.NET was devised, the username to store in the authentication cookie was more than enough. No, roles, maybe, pictures, and just the username was enough. And uh, stuffing the username in the authentication cookie is uh, the easiest you can do in ASP.NET web forms and then uh, MVC. In the API, at a lower level of abstraction, there is also something that you could use to add extra information in the authentication cookie, but very few developers ever use it because it's a little bit you know, tricky to, to work with. But yet we have the problems of now in modern applications to sometimes store more than just the username in the cookie. So at least the role, maybe the user picture, and maybe other custom claims about the user. Okay. Authentication in ASP.NET Core uses no longer a single string to stuff in the cookie, but the serialization of, it's an array of strings, basically, and those strings take the name of claims. Authorization works unchanged, plus something called uh, policy-based authorization. 
again, it comes from experience. It's another example of engineering uh, best practices or collecting feedback uh, from the industry. You know that most applications work by roles. But when it comes to permissions to execute a given action, the role may or may not be enough. Because when we, we, the, the model is, uh, the, the role is uh, a concept too flat for most realistic uses. So yes, you have the role, but you also have maybe sub-roles, maybe other conditions to check. So in general, to determine whether the user has the permission to execute an action, you need uh, something more than just the role. You need a, a piece of code, you need a policy. Again, yeah, authorization comes with this extra feature. And uh, in terms of coding, uh, this extra feature is uh, essentially configuration of the authorization runtime service you do in startup and is also about uh, um, using claims and combining claims uh, using and and or boolean operators and if uh, uh, this is not enough yet to express the logic you need for a particular method. You, you can also write custom handlers, custom claims that have logic and not just value checking to determine uh, the policy required for giving permission to execute a given action. And I already mentioned Web API, which disappears. So if today you need to expose JSON endpoints, you just create a controller class, period. Uh, this controller class in ASP.NET Core has inside the ability to do the thing that was sold has the major difference between Web API and, uh, and uh, uh, controllers, so content negotiation. So has now the controller in core has the ability to look into the uh, accept header in the incoming request and if you use the particular method to generate the output, uh, content negotiation may or may not take place. So if you want, you have in the controller class also the same set of functionalities of web API. So this is no longer a scenario that makes sense. There is no longer an API controller. Actually, they introduced the API controller back in uh, 3.0, but it does a different thing, so it provides uh, uh, built-in uh, uh, Swagger features, so it has nothing to do with the API controller class you may remember from uh, uh, non-core uh, ASP.NET. The name is the same, but the behavior is different. So this is the way to go. So just derive from controller and then write your methods and make your methods return uh, JSON. The term Web API, in summary, comes to get its real meaning. It's just an API over the web, an interface made of a number of publicly exposed HTTP endpoints, which for the most part, but not necessarily, return uh, a JSON. And whether you give this, num this uh, collection of endpoints a REST or an RPC design, well, that is entirely, entirely up to you. And the moment you decide to give uh, this front end an RPC remote procedure call design, so instead of relying on get or on HTTP verbs on resources, you just call endpoints that trigger task. If you decide to go that way, you might want to consider gRPC. Because gRPC runs on HTTP 2, which is designed to be faster than HTTP 1.1 and works also in a different way. You also have binary transfer of data. So specifically for microservice to microservice kind of communication, gRPC can really be an interesting uh, scenario to, um, uh, to tackle. Uh, Web API, what about security? Uh, technically, basic authentication is still an option. Uh, custom token-based authentication, so in which you give uh, your own in-house generated token, which is 
past in some way is still uh, an option. Identity management service, server is uh, the, the, the upcoming way if you can afford having a separate uh, server to do uh, the authentication for the web API, JWT is, uh, is the way to go and the primary reason for this is of course that the client of a web API is no longer not necessarily um, a web application but could be a mobile uh, application. Okay, uh, to finish off the presentation let me switch out of PowerPoint and let me give you a brief demo of a, a gRPC service as we can have it out from, uh, oh, is it possible that it's, okay. So what we have here is um, sample application uh, just created out, uh, out of uh, the Visual Studio uh, template. Uh, Web Application 3 is the server that exposes uh, endpoints using the gRPC uh, uh, protocol. And uh, this is exactly what you get out of Visual Studio. So let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, program CS uh, is, is the normal canonical uh, uh, starter of an inspector Core application, so there is nothing there that makes sense to look at. It's more interesting to take a look at Startup CS instead. Here we go. We have uh, this uh, add the gRPC in the configure uh, services, and we have in configure we have the, this pair of calls. Now, user routing is not specifically there for gRPC, but it's one of the new features that Microsoft added in between 2.2 and 3.0. It's a sort of a global routing that by the means of which you declare that you are going to use a, a, a routing in this application and this makes possible, the use routing at that point, makes possible for pieces of middleware that may have been registered, which is not the case in this demo, to know uh, where exactly the request is going to be processed. So the, the final URL is already known to middleware component that may be placed along the way. And then use endpoints essentially adds to the route table being used by the application the endpoints for uh, the gRPC service based on the class greeter service. And the class greeter service is my class. It's, the, cl it's uh, the, the counterpart of my controller class. It's the facade, it's the endpoint, it's where all of my requests end up. So this is a class uh, that inherits from uh, some base class, I will tell you about that in three seconds. Uh, it, this is an abstract class, so, so we override a method called in this case, say hello, this is my endpoint. Say hello receives a message, takes its input from this hello request uh, type, and the server call context is the context of the call for us to take a look at the uh, URL that made the request. It's the equivalent, the same part as uh, the HTTP context in plain uh, HTTP-based uh, interfaces, and this is that just the behavior of the method, we just create a new hello reply instance and we set the message property on hello reply. Now, the question to ask is where do hello request, hello reply, and greeter based class come from? As you can see, this class, greeter service, is the implementation of a contract. But the contract is not in this class. The contract reasonably could be here, but trust me, if you take the source code of this project and look for 
this class. You won't find this class anywhere. At the same time, if you, in this case, uh, uh, we, we sharpen installed, I do F12, I see that this class does exist. In the project, Twitter base, and this class has a, a virtual method called say hello, which is overridden in a derived class, and it also has uh, uh, should be visible some, at some point. It also has uh, um, the class. Uh, it's greeter is a static class, and greeter base is a class in the in the static class. So greeter dot greeter base makes sense. This class. This, source, this C sharp code has been generated by the action of one of the NuGet packages we find automatically attached to our project, gRPC tools, which brings in a sort of a, a protocol buffer compiler. And uh, this tool is responsible for um, taking this file here, I'm sorry, it's the same, but yeah, we are in the, this is the client, so let me close the client for a moment. So there is also a protos folder with a proto text file, which, is, which contains the interface definition language. It contains the contract for any class. If I open, and this proto file is compiled to C sharp, to produce the greeter base class that is used as the contract from which we derive the actual implementation of the service. Uh, if I open up this, we have uh, the following. The syntax, okay, Proto3, this is the latest syntax, the name of the package, the name of the service, it's called greeter. This is the interface uh, of the service. Uh, RPC to indicate this is a method, it's called say hello, it takes hello request, it returns a hello reply, and then hello request and hello reply are listed in the same proto file as message types. Uh, message types is a POCO, it's a POCO class, essentially. Uh, string name or oh, equals one, uh, it's not the default value of the name a property of the message, hello request, or hello reply. But it's uh, something called the field number. Indicates that position in the binary protocol, it's a relative indicator of the position in the binary uh, buffer for each request where the value for the name property is found. Uh, it also uh, takes the, serves the purpose of essentially um, helping with uh, uh, with uh, versioning, okay, of uh, messages. Okay, that's it. Uh, um, the client for uh, this uh, service uh, is uh, get gets the same uh, uh, protos uh, folder and the same file, and this is the way in which we make the link between the we reference the assembly on the client side and. Uh, the source code to invoke it doesn't use HTTP client, but follows a similar pattern. Uh, we create a client, which is also uh, um, generated after the compiling of this. Um, so I was here. And then once we have the client, uh, we essentially prepare the request. We call the client. And then, uh, and then it works. Uh, and you know, we have a situation like this. This is the this is the server application up and running. Okay, and waiting for uh, for a request. So this is the command, the console application that uh, gRPC client. Uh, I just type a name here. And uh, the moment uh, I confirm this, uh, hello, and then the name is returned, but a number of other requests have been processed and been logged in the console application. 
So this is um, essentially a very basic example of how gRPC works. Uh, under the hood, it's a binary data transfer. And uh, again, for using gRPC these days, the most common scenario is microservice to microservice communication for pairs of microservices, uh, really problematic uh, from the point of view of performance, uh, and also microservices that ideally are both under your control. Okay? So, thank you very much for, uh, for your time. I will be around in the discussion zone if you have questions about gRPC or whatever else uh, you want. Thank you very much for your time.